My name is Paul Wellstone, and I approve this message. Ozzy and me are going to put the first flag up this morning. Hi. Everybody wave your flag. Yay! 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 We are a class of 27 4th, 5th, and 6th graders at Lake Country Montessori in Minneapolis. We studied the life of Paul Wellstone over a whole school year with the artist Media Mike Hazard and our teacher Mindy Holty. We kept journals, wrote poems, painted a mural, watched videos, sang and danced, read books, and interviewed people who knew Paul. And action. Paul liked to have fun, and we had fun too. That's the microphone and the headsets feeding back to each other. We made this documentary about the teacher and senator from Minnesota to show you what we learned. Come with us and take a trip with Paul Wellstone on the Magic Green School Bus. There. If the senator was alive, he'd be proud of you guys for what he's love you to death. I know that. Here we go. The big bus is rolling. Hang on, you guys. Did you want to hear my ugo horn? <laughs> that was a great horn. We loved it for parades. <laughs> Kids loved yeah. it. This was a lean green campaign machine. And then some folks call it uh, the Senate office on wheels. We had a lot of fun on this bus when Paul was with us. I'm sure he's healing all those people. And then, see, this phone don't work. But I told the news media it was to the Wellstone office, and the white one was to the white to the uh, White House. And one <laughs> one writer actually wrote that, and actually they're not even connected. But Paul sometimes would pick that white one up and say, "We're connected, aren't we, Paul?" I'd say, "Yeah." <laughs> After 33 years driving for Greyhound Lines, Paul Scott became the first driver for Paul's bus. It was awesome to me, and you guys can imagine, if you're a bus driver, you know, you're way down on the totem pole. But the Senator of the United States, on the average of uh, every two months, would call me. I'd answer my phone and say, good morning. He'd say, hi, Paul. Just, he'd talk just like we do. It was unbelievable. And he'd say, what are we going to do about Iraq? I'd say, Paul, ask me about the bus. I don't know about Iraq. He was in it a lot, you know, when he was campaigning. And, and he could have been riding in a Cadillac or a big limousine or, you know, had a chauffeur. But no, he, he took the bus. Well, Paul was a symbol of a person that had always fought for the underdog and he cared about guys like you and me, just average people. And there were just so many qualities of him that I admired. Also, he reminded me a little bit of my dad. So those are just a couple of reasons, but he was just such a, a leader and a fighter for the poor, the underdog, people didn't have anything, the unions, health, he wanted to work hard for health. The veterans, he was an absolute champion for the veterans. I happen to be a veteran of Korea. But it just that he stood so much for America and what it's about, what we want it to be about. Now that he's gone, it's very, very sad. Some days I actually feel his presence in there, which is silly, but I'm old, so I can do that. should be respected all around the world because we have a leader who has good character, who has integrity, and who is a good person. Then you come out and vote today and you vote for a change. Okay.
Will you promise me you guys will run for public office one day? Yeah. So I, 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 I want to be president. president. Okay, that's wonderful. Can I work on your campaign? Paco Hang is an activist who worked on Paul's last campaign for re-election to the Senate. Her job was to educate Paul about immigrant issues and to work to get out the vote. Paul changed her life. Paul liked me a lot because I'm short, like him, and he used to say that that's why he liked all the Hmong people so much, because we were short like him. We were his brothers and sisters. And he really liked the Somalis too, but he said, Paku, they're so tall. Because <laughs> they would always be like, you know, he would always shake their, like they would be shaking his hand, but he'd always have to look up. So, um, so in that way, I think, you know, there was a certain affinity, a certain friendship there. He made you feel like you could do anything. I mean, he was like a favorite teacher. In fact, so many people, you know, on this campaign, so many people were his old students. And I remember one time we were at True Thai, we were having dinner with the campaign, and they were naming off all the people who were working on the campaign, who had gone to Carleton or who had been his student. And I, re think, I remember thinking in my head, oh, this is his true legacy, was that he is a teacher. Even before or even you know, above being a senator, he is inherently a teacher. And what he does is he teaches people and he empowers them to be the best they can be. You know, that's essentially the essence of a teacher. I thought, oh, that is what Paul Wellstone is. And I think one of the reasons why I decided to um, go and get my PhD, uh, a PhD is essentially um, the degree you need to do to get to become a professor. Because I, I want to be a teacher like Paul. And I hope that um, through my education and hopefully through the people that I meet, that I'll be able to influence people and be able to teach people the way that Paul had taught me. So that we can be kind of a ripple, you know, Paul would maybe the rock, but the ripple will continue. And hopefully my students will teach other students and we can have more people who are thoughtful and kind and compassionate. Okay, there's one, there's, oh, that one. This, is the, this is the good one. This is yeah, the really good the one. one. That's the best this one. is called Fast Pace Paul. This was the first one that, that we did. And, um, and uh, there was a big debate because uh, most people thought this was silly in the campaign. They thought, if you put that on there, people are just gonna, they're not gonna think he's a serious candidate. Mark Anderson was press secretary in Paul's first race for the Senate. He showed us some campaign commercials and talked about telling your story. Should we put it on? Should we not put it on? Finally, they decided, well, we'll put it on. And so they put it on. They held their breath to see, well, who knows what will happen, right? What will the reaction be? And then people really, really liked it. So anyway, here's, uh, let's play it. And Hi, I'm Paul Wellstone, and I'm running for the United States Senate from Minnesota. Unlike my opponent, I don't have $6 million, so I'm going to have to talk fast. This is my wife, Sheila, and our children. This is my house in Northville, where I've lived for 21 years. My son, David, farms, and I've worked with Minnesota farmers for years. We must stop the poisoning of the air and the land and the water. I'll lead the fight for national health care. I've been a teacher for 24 years. Labor indoors. Paul State Wellstone won't politics. slow down after he's elected. Vote for Paul Wellstone on November 6th. <laughs> when you're in a campaign, you, you have to tell your story. You have to tell your story about who you are, what you believe in, what you want to do when you get elected, so that people can say, yeah, I, I think I like that, what he's going to work for, what he's going to work on. And TV is really important to do that. And uh, I think that's how he viewed the work, was that it was really an enormous challenge, but that if we if we did our best, we could really make the world a better place. He also said, uh, we're not fighting for heaven on earth, just a better earth on earth. In other words, not, not perfection, but let's make it a better place. And uh, to me, that's why I loved working with him. He's such a, a spirit for, for good in our world. Everyone called him Paul. He was born in 1944 in Arlington, Virginia. His father, Leon, was a Jewish immigrant from Russia. His mother, Minnie, worked hard in the school cafeteria. Whenever he went to a school, the senator always visited the lunchroom. He had one brother, Stephen. Paul was born dyslexic, making math and reading really hard for him. 
He did so poorly on standardized tests, his application for college was turned down at first. Still, he was such a great wrestler. He won a scholarship and he was later elected to the College Wrestling Hall of Fame. While in college, he married his childhood sweetheart, Sheila. They had three children, David, Mark, and Marsha. Paul earned a PhD in political science from the University of North Carolina. His first and only teaching job was as a professor at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. There is one lesson I have learned that I hold above all others from my experience as a father, teacher, community organizer, and U.S. Senator. We should never separate the lives we live from the words we speak. He wrote books to teach what he had learned, working on different issues as a community organizer. In a tremendous upset victory, he was elected to the United States Senate in 1990 and re-elected in 1996. I would like to dedicate this moment to my father, who was a Jewish immigrant from the Soviet Union, who is no longer alive, but who I'm absolutely sure knows that because of Minnesotans, I'm now serving in the United States Senate. I'm going to do well for people. Thank you so much. Paul's life ended in a plane crash on October 25th, 2002. This time, as so often before, death snatched a big one. When we could not stand to lose his voice that spoke, not alone, but for us millions who longed for a world green, alive, about to bloom. The writer Bill Holm praised Paul as a politician with a vision for America. I agreed with almost all of his notions about what America should be like. I mean, he was the politician who more than anybody else said what kind of a place I'd like to live in. A place where, you know, nobody goes to bed hungry. A place where everybody has health care. A place where people don't use religion as a club to beat each other over the head with, but practice kindness and tolerance. Uh, a country where, you know, people have stopped mistreating one another because of their race or because of their sex or because of their opinions or anything else and where we're tolerant and kindly toward each other. So I thought he said that and that was important to me. Open your eyes really <laughs> At the end of a lively day, Connie Lewis spoke about having fun when you work. She was chief of staff in Minnesota for the senator. You guys are just a little bit wired. One thing that I, I liked a lot about them is that they like to have fun. They, um, and especially if we were traveling together and it was both Paul and Sheila, and um, Sheila would like to tease Paul a little bit and, and they would laugh and, you know, um, tell funny stories. And so I, like, I liked that. There was a sense of fun and, you know, Paul would, called it you he'd always say you have to have a twinkle in your eye which meant you have to have fun when you're doing this work and so I like that about them working with Mina Learwood Pam Christian turned her car into a mobile monument for the Wellstones her scrappy car is a good symbol for Scrappy Paul. It had dings in it, it has little, it had dents in it when I bought it. It just wasn't perfect, but it wanted to keep going. You know, and Paul at the end, remember with his MS? It was MS, right? He, um, he wasn't a picture of health. He wasn't in perfect shape, but he wanted to keep going, and he did.
Wellstone Action is an organization created to teach people the skills they need to run for office. The director, Jeff Blodgett, was a campaign manager for Paul. He talked about politics and power. The thing about politics is that um, there's big ideas and a set of beliefs, and then there's a, a set of skills that you have to, have to know to practice politics effectively and well. Um, and uh, the other thing I learned about to, uh, from Paul is that it's important to believe strongly in things, but it's also important to win uh, in politics because winning means that then you can, then you can actually have power and, uh, and, and accomplish things. So he wasn't about just running for office for the sake of doing it. He wanted to win his elections so that he could uh, implement his ideas. And so we try to teach people some of, the, uh, some of the ways that you can win campaigns, the skills involved in winning campaigns. Someone wants us to, uh, you know, do these, you know, and they will only cost $500. And I looked at them and I'm like, I'm not going to pay $500 for that. Uh, but the person went out and had them printed anyway. And uh, so, and they're, they're like finger puppet. They're, it's, like a, it's like a finger puppet bus. And when you run a campaign, you have to resist the, uh, resist the um, temptation to buy a lot of things like this because you really have to spend your money on what matters. Um, and so I said no, but they showed up anyway. <laughs> Rick Kahn took classes from Paul at Carleton College and became Paul's closest friend. He was also treasurer for his campaigns. Paul taught Rick that we have to be strong to fight for what we believe in. This was Paul Wellstone's favorite weightlifting exercise. Paul went to the gym six days a week. He didn't go on Sunday, but every other day he would go to the gym and no matter where he was, whether he was here, whether he was in Washington, whether he was traveling somewhere, there would always be a gym six days a week that he would go to and exercise really hard. If you feel strong, then you feel like you can defend yourself, not in a fight, but when you... That's why I always say that Paul did this, is that he needed to feel strong when he was fighting against the world on something where most everybody was disagreeing with him, but he thought he was right. Um, I love these words, is we all do better when we all do better. And to me, that was just so clear. And he just simply meant if somebody is not doing well, if they're sick and we're not doing anything to help them, if they don't have enough money, if they're not getting the education, if they're not getting the health care that they need and deserve, um, and other people are getting more than enough, that's wrong. We all need to be doing better for all of us to do better. And I believe that. For Paul, that was just the core of his own personal belief and philosophy about the world. Listening to Rick, we saw Paul shining inside him. A student had become a teacher who is now teaching us. Republican Congressman Jim Ramstad worked with Paul the Democrat to write laws about mental health and addiction. While they disagreed on many issues, they found common ground. I loved him like a brother. Um, he was uh, one of the uh, most genuine people I've ever known in my lifetime. Um, I uh, not only enjoyed working with him, but I enjoyed uh, some of my favorite uh, dinners uh, that Catherine and I had were with Paul and Sheila in their home uh, over in St. Paul. Uh, Sheila made the best lasagna uh, anywhere. And we would sit and talk for four, five, six hours sometimes uh, over dinner and, and coffee. And uh, uh, Paul would, uh, was fond of saying uh, when we appeared jointly uh, and we had disagreements on certain issues, he would say, Ramstead, I love you like a brother, but how can you be so wrong? <laughs> or, or he would say, Ram said, you know, for a Republican, you're not so bad. He said, uh, he, would, he would say, he said, I think you're teachable. I think you can be educated. And he, and he before he um, left this earth, he used to tell me uh, whenever I'd get discouraged over not passing um, 
uh, treatment parity legislation for people suffering from addiction, Paul would say, now, Jim, don't get discouraged. Just remember, it took 40 years to pass the Civil Rights Act, banning discrimination in this country and public accommodations based on the color of people's skin. 40 years. So don't worry, we're going to get it done. Uh, we're just going to keep fighting. Uh, I remember those uh, evenings uh, very, very, uh, very, very well, and we'll always cherish those uh, times together and those memories. Rick Kahn suggested we go visit Lakewood Cemetery, where Sheila and Paul are buried. He also taught us that it is a Jewish tradition to honor the dead with small stones or other gifts. So before we went, each of us thought of something to bring. And we wrote letters to Paul. October morning, little plane on the forest floor Up on the TV, between a rerun and another war Here in a hotel, trying to make some sense of this Two thousand miles from my family in Minneapolis Hey Senator I want to say all the things you fought for did not die here today. Hey, Senator, I'm going to do all the things I can to live my life more like you. put something from their own, like from their cells on here. I bought Paul Wellstone an apple because I thought that he was a good teacher and I think every good teacher deserves an apple. Oh my gosh. I think that was Eleanor. Really? Yeah. Oh, that is precious. And it says a teacher. I know because you know you always give apples to the teacher. Yep. Dear Paul, in my life you have never left. You will never leave, because you can't. Because we are still fighting, still fighting for peace. Dear Paul, I gave you a red rock. I chose this rock because it looks like a real heart, and I think you have a love and care for everything. The thing you taught me was how to live my life with integrity. I'm very, very grateful for that gift. Your little Republican friend, Spencer Summers. Dear Paul Wellstone, I admire you for speaking up even when people called you embarrassingly liberal. I think if God brought anybody up from the dead with their body restored, it would be you, because our country is in need of your help and advice. Sincerely, Laura. Let's all each step forward one more time and touch the stone, and then we'll get ready to go. Dear Paul Wellstone, I couldn't figure out what to bring, so I brought my spirit. I think that is all I needed to give. Sincerely, Jonah B. Oh, 
We hope you enjoyed the trip. It's a wrap.